All right, we are ready to go. Uh, welcome to this webinar. It's organized by NCAP for Health um, and the Bioencapsulation Research Group. If the other panelists can, can you please put on your videos? My name is uh, Andre Broadkorb, and I'm joined today uh, with five five of my colleagues, uh, five panelists, and that today's topic is uh, in vivo and in vitro uh, food digestion and their application for uh, encapsulation. And that has been organized, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as part of the NCAP for Health uh, project. So uh, without any delay, I will start with my presentation. And I'll give you an overview of the models, and then we move on to uh, um, the, uh, um, the overview of the project and five um, uh, case studies, four case studies, okay? All right, can you see my screen? I think you can, yeah. Okay, very good. As I mentioned, my name is Andre Bordkop. I'm based in the Chagas Food Research Center here in uh, Moorpark. Uh, I'm part of an organization called Chagas, is an Irish word, it's pronounced Chagas. And uh, we are basically providing um, research, advisor, and training to the agri-food sector in, in Ireland. We are uh, based in the south of Ireland. I just changed my uh, pointer. Here we go. We are based uh, in the Republic of Ireland, right here in the south of Ireland. Cork is down here, and Dublin is over there. Um, and over the last couple of years, we here in Moorpark and in my group have been interested in the subject of food structure and uh, their relation to uh, food digestion, how structure can impact the food digestion uh, in the gastrointestinal tract. For instance, if you have a protein, a whey protein, the digestion is relatively fast. After digestion, you have practically nothing left because all is digested and absorbed. In contrast to that, if you have something like a breakfast cereal, a very common breakfast cereal, Weedabix here, uh, the digestion is very different. You have cells and you have intact cells and fibers at the end of the uh, digestion. Here you see a, uh, an example of in vitro versus in vivo. So uh, over the last 150 years, a lot of information has been provided uh, to uh, research on the oral gastric and intestinal phase. And over the last uh, 30 or so years, uh, the subject of the colonic uh, um, digestion, so in the large intestine, uh, uh, has been has, has exploded. So we are interested in the upper gastrointestinal uh, tract. So if you want to um, understand how food is digested, we have to use models, and that would be a human or animal model, or if you can't work with it, uh, in vitro models, and there are three different types of in vitro models. And that's what I, I'm going to uh, show you in the next couple of slides. So the first question is, you know, what, what am I looking for? Can I use in vivo models? And one of the common models would be uh, the animal model, uh, this pig model. Uh, and here you either have to kill the pig, and that's really a blood and guts, or you uh, uh, look at something like a mini pig where you can uh, cannulate um, the pig and you can take samples out of these ports from the stomach or small intestine. On the other hand, you can use human models. So if you want to understand food digestion, you actually have to go into the uh, gastrointestinal tract and you do that with something like a tube here, nasal gastric or nasal uh, um, jejunal uh, tube. That's what it looks like. So you basically put a tube uh, into the nose, into the stomach, uh, and you can take samples out. Here there's another model where you actually uh, put it through the, through the mouth in the stomach. But as you, as you can imagine, it's quite invasive. Recently, we have used another model, and that's called um, uh, ileostomy. So that's patients that 
do not have a large intestine for one reason or another, usually is colon cancer, but they have a ileostomy bag, so a bag at the end of the ileum. And we have recently used that to study food digestion. So again, here's our friend Wiedebix, uh, that's the in vitro digestion. On the right-hand side, you have an in vivo digestion. So this is digested Wiedebix from the small intestine of, uh, of a patient. Uh, and that's one of the applications. Uh, my colleague, Daniela Freitas, um, she uh, led this study and we looked at the uh, survival of probiotic bacteria. That's with uh, uh, colleagues in Deerland, now ADM. And we had crystal clear results on how their uh, probiotic bacteria, in this case, it was a, a spore, um, survived the gastrointestinal tract. And that's exactly what we uh, need to look at. So in vivo models are in general very good. Human models or animal models. Um, however, they are always expensive. They are uh, very time consuming, uh, especially animal models are uh, seen as unethical now. So a lot of food companies don't want animal models anymore. Whereas in human models, there are certain instances where it's also unethical and you can't, yeah, you can't do a human intervention trial such as infants. So there is a place for in vitro lab-based models, but all of them are of course simpler because you don't have this complicated interplay between chemistry, biochemistry and physical interaction. Um, so, the in vitro models, you basically have three types, static, dynamic, and mixtures uh, of static and dynamic. Um, and all these models try to simulate the oral phase in one way or the other, gastric or intestinal phase. So the uh, dynamic models, uh, dynamic digestion models, I have three here. Uh, the TIM model, the model got from developed in uh, Norwich in the UK, and the Mainville earlier model, they're pretty much all the same. So you have a compartment that simulates the gastric phase or the stomach. So in the TIM model, that's over here. So bit by bit, the pH is, is decreased after uh, consumption of the food and you have addition of the enzyme. That's why you have these computer controlled uh, pumps. And that is then transferred or gastric emptied into the small intestine. And again, you have a number of pumps to uh, simulate the addition of uh, base and the addition of uh, bile acid and um, uh, enzymes. Uh, so these uh, dynamic models, they're good. Uh, however, you know, they're quite complicated. So uh, at the moment, there's something like, you know, 10, 11, 12 models out there. And uh, two years ago, uh, I was organizing um, a, a webinar and all these 11 uh, available uh, models uh, had a time slot of 20 minutes if you're interested in that. So these models are good. Um, however, there are some disadvantages. For instance, access is a, a disadvantage. So gastrointestinal digestion takes several hours. So you can only do a one or two samples per day. Most of them are commercial or semi-commercial, hence they are not standardized, okay? So they are proprietary. Uh, and of course, costs, they are very, uh, they are expensive uh, to purchase and they are expensive to run. So there is a need for simpler models and the simplest model is the static model. So if you're working uh, with pharmaceuticals, you may be uh, uh, familiar with this model, the pharmacopoeia dissolution method as a standardized method, uh, you know, standardized vessels, standardized pedal, uh, uh, paddles, and they are really for drug dissolution, but they are not suitable for food digestion. They're suitable for drug and they're standardized, but they're not suitable to follow the digestion of food. So uh, out of this need, a um, uh, EU funded cost action mm -hmm. came together and I had the privilege of leading one of the working groups with my colleague uh, Isida Rithio from uh, Madrid. And over the next three or so years, we came up with an international consensus model and that was published in 2014. And five years later, uh, a more detailed method uh, was published in Nature Protocols. Uh, a lot of authors, really all the specialists in, 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 in vitro food digestion and in vivo for that matter, uh, so it was a true international consensus. Uh, the parameters are 
uh, based on available physiological data. So some of the uh, some of the data is just not available. So it was best best guess, but most of the data was uh, based on available physiological data. And to date, this is really the uh, academic and industry standard for food digestion. And there's a, a, a move towards an ISO method for protein digestibility as highly standard, highly, highly cited papers. Both are highly cited papers. Uh, so in this um, um, method, it's called the InfoGest method, we uh, uh, clarify each individual step. So what you have to do uh, a couple of days beforehand, we put a number on it. So at least five days a week, preparation of all the assimilated um, uh, digestive fluids, uh, perform the enzyme activity and all that. So that is a big part of the preparation uh, of the digestion so that you uh, standardize the enzyme activities. You actually determine them because if you buy an enzyme product off the shelf, uh, um, they give you all kinds of numbers, but they're not standardized. Okay. And then we go through step-by-step step, the oral phase, the gastric phase. Here, for instance, we... Uh, say pepsin activity of 2000 units per milliliter uh, at 30, 33 degrees, two hours at pH three. So the pH three, so a static model is basically a one pot model, okay? Um, so during the two hours, the, uh, um, the pH doesn't change, the uh, um, ratio between food and digestive fluid doesn't change, so it's a true static method. And the pH three is the average gastric pH, the average gastric pH. Okay, so at the beginning it is high, at the end of the digestion is generally low in vivo, so this is the average pH. And then after two hours you change the conditions um, to intestinal phase, uh, again, pH 7, two hours, and then afterwards we have a whole section on how to treat the sample. So sample, sample treatment is very, very important. So as I mentioned, this is the academic and industry standard now. It is widely used for proteins, but also for lipids and carbohydrates. For some of the smaller compounds, minerals, uh, probiotics, encapsulation devices, and we see some examples later, exocellular vesicles. Uh, we are also looking at bioaccessibility and bioavailability. So if you are looking at cell cultures, you usually do the infogest method first and then put the digester onto cells to look at the bioavailable uh, fraction. So the static model, the infogest model is good for screening uh, different samples. Uh, um, and it is good uh, for an estimation of the endpoint. So end of gastric and end of intestinal phase is pretty accurate. It is not so good if you're looking at kinetics, simply because we have an average pH. So the pH three is there for two hours. So after one hour, it doesn't mean it is a half, half time. Okay, so kinetics, the static, the static methods are not suitable for kinetics. So you really have to look at what, uh, ask the question, what are you looking for? What is the endpoint of the digestion? So uh, out, of, uh, out of this discrepancy between static and dynamic uh, uh, methods, uh, we developed a semi dynamic digestion method. So we have a dynamic gastric phase with uh, commercially available equipment. So these vessels, we have uh, pumps here, we have uh, um, um, 3D printed mixers. Uh, so in this case, we uh, simulate the progressive acidification of the food, uh, the gradual in uh, addition of enzymes and uh, digestive gastric fluid. And we have a continuous emptying. So this is an example of the continuous emptying. We start with the food. Um, here in this case, is something like 22 uh, milliliters. And bit by bit, you remove the sample. So this is called gastric emptying. Of course, you don't have, you don't simulate the peristaltic uh, movement, but this is a, is a good method if you're looking for gastric digestion. So afterwards, uh, after gastric phase, uh, you you basically do a static intestinal phase. Okay, so um, this is where we are at the moment with in vitro methods for food. So we have a um, published 
uh, recognized international con consensus on um, on the adult, so that's the InfoGest method, and a well-established uh, infant method. Uh, and here's an error that was just published for the elderly. So for the older adult, so it is Menar, same author as here, 2023, and that was just published. Um, and we have a semi-dynamic method for adults. And at the moment, we are working on extending this method towards infants and towards older adults. And we are, hope, we are hoping to have this published within the next year. Okay, and I think that's my last slide. Yes, it is. Okay, so there's space for, um, for question and answers at the very end. Um, so the next speaker is um, Rotio Morales. Uh, Rotio is a postdoctorate in the Technical University in Berlin. Her specialty is uh, dietary fibers, uh, upcycling, and their use for encapsulation. But Rotio has been the project manager of the Encap for Health uh, project. So she has been uh, closely working with all of us uh, uh, who never answer emails and uh, are always late with reports. So Rotio was very good at it. The Encap for Health um, uh, project was led from the Technical University in Berlin. And Rotio will just present this now. Thank you, Andre, for that insightful overview on digestion models, and a big thanks to everyone joining us today. In the next few minutes, I'll introduce you to the Encap for Health project. You'll learn who we are and how we've been testing an exciting array of materials from green proteins as rubisco and polysaccharides as pectins to their conjugates and microcapsules. And Cap for Health is powered by a robust consortium of 12 institutions. We count with industrial partners like CP Kelco, Synrise, Micropore, and Cap Process, Anabayo, and Saporiti. We are also backed by leading academic institutions, including Instituto Nacional de Tecnología Industrial, Universidad de la Frontera, Loboro University, the Medical University Center of Groningen, Chagas, and Technical University of Berlin. Together, our international team spans eight countries. So what have these institutions achieved together? We've brought over 30 researchers who have conducted research stays for 135 months, combining diverse specialties to develop innovative concepts for biopolymer-based microcapsules. Our aim is to create a new generation of highly functional delivery systems for foods. To achieve our ambitious goal, we concentrated on three key areas, materials, processing, and formulation and functionality. Firstly, we prioritized the identification of innovative materials. This involved characterizing green protein alternatives such as hemp or rubisco protein. Additionally, many of our members investigated the relationship between tailored pectin structures and the functionality. Also, we produced conjugates using some of those materials. Secondly, we focus on revising and improving current processing methods for delivery systems. This included membrane processing to produce plant-based coacervates, a topic we previously covered in a webinar. Also, some of our members dedicated efforts to improve the external regulation technique. Lastly, to accomplish our objective, we assess the functionality of our new systems. This involved evaluating their role in colonic health and determining the digestibility of both our new materials and formulated microcapsules, the topic that brought us here today. We've disseminated our findings, not just through publications, but also via numerous webinars available on the bioencapsulation and microencapsulation YouTube channel. There, you'll discover a wealth of knowledge of microencapsulation, its applications in food, pharmacy, and medicine, as well as detailed descriptions of encapsulation techniques and insightful case studies. We invite you to join us on this learning journey.
So thanks, Andre, for the nice introduction. I would like also to mention the coordinator of the project, who is Professor Stefan Drush, who could not join us today, but he trusts totally the huge team uh, that is a cup for health. And one of the members of that huge team is Sara Perez, who is conducted um, her PhD thesis research in Chagas together with Andre. And her main topic is Rubisco. And basically in the fourth years of her PhD, she has been studying how to extract it, it the, um, the chemical and physical structure. She has also evaluated the functional properties, application on emulsions and also digestibility. So Sarah, the floors or the screen is yours. Hello, my name is Sara Perez Vila, and today I'm going to present our work about digesting protein extracts from green leaves, mainly constituted by Rubisco. Why do we need to develop new sources of proteins? There is a continuous growth in the world population, which is expected to reach 10 billion people by 2050. Additionally, consumers are shifting to diets more based on plant proteins such as vegetarians, vegans, or flexitarians, and there is an increasing concern about reduce the waste associated to the food production with more demand of local products. All this drives to the need of developing new sources of proteins to achieve a more sustainable and healthy diet. In this context, plants have been proposed as the preferred source of alternative proteins, and specifically green leaves are proposed as a source of rubisco, which is an enzyme that takes part of the photosynthesis and the main protein in the soluble fraction of green leaves. The advantages that it presents compared with other plant proteins are that rubisco is considered the most abundant protein in the nature. Moreover, previous works have reported promising functional properties. It presents a complete amino acid profile, covering the recommendations for all essential amino acids. And Rubisco presents a preserved form between multiple species, being common in different green leaves. This will allow using endogenous crops in different regions as a source of this protein. First, for doing the protein extraction from the green leaves, we must consider the leaf physiology. This can be divided in three main parts. First, we have the cell wall and membrane, which is the insoluble in water and can be uh, recovered in the fiber fraction. Second, the chloroplast material, which is constituted by the tilakoid proteins and the chlorophyll. This fraction is easily denaturalized by heat treatment at 50 degrees or after a drying process, becoming insoluble and easily to separate. And finally, the fraction of interest for us is the cytoplasmic proteins, which are constituted mainly by rubisco, and is usually called white protein fraction, as it is described as colorless and tasteless. We have been working with different green leaves as a starting material for the protein extraction, but today I will speak about perennial ryegrass and quinoa leaves. In the case of perennial ryegrass, the method of extraction consists on pressing the grass with a juicer to remove the fiber and obtain a green juice with a soluble fraction. This sample is heated at 50 degrees for half an hour to denaturalize the tilakoid proteins and improve their removal during the next centrifugation step. In the case of the quinoa leaves, due to its seasonal crop, the leaves were harvested, dried and grinded, it, obtaining a leaf powder. This was suspended in water to extract the soluble compounds. From the soluble fraction obtained, the following process was the same for both materials. The juice was centrifuged to remove the chloroplast materials and subsequently the proteins were concentrated by acid precipitation, decreasing the pH close to the isoelectric point of Rubisco. Finally, the protein pellet was suspended in water, adjusted to neutral pH and freeze dry to obtain a protein concentrate powder. Regarding the nutritional value, both protein extracts cover the recommendations for all the essential amino acids determined by the FAO 2011. This will uh, be in agreement with other works which reported that Rubisco presents a complete amino acid profile, including the sulfur-containing amino acids, which are usually deficient in other plant proteins. The digestibility of the protein extracts was assessed through the in vitro static digestion method by the InfoGest International Consensus. For that, 1 gram of simulated meal containing 4% of protein and 0.25 grams of protein-free cookie was employed. The digestibility was tested on the raw proteins and after a heat treatment at 95 degrees for 30 minutes to simulate a cooking process. The digestibility was quantified by three different methods, 
primary aminas, total amino acids and total nitrogen. And both protein extracts resulted in an almost complete digestibility, even after the heat treatment. Subsequently, the different digestion points were characterized by confocal microscope. I will present just the results of the grass protein concentrate due to both extracts were very similar. Here we could observe that the proteins were completely digested after the intestinal phase. In the bottom of the slide we see the images of the heated samples, which presented some protein aggregations in the initial sample and after the gastric phase. But this was completely disappeared after the intestinal phase, due to a complete digestion. Finally, we also run the samples by SDS page. First, we have under the arrows the initial samples. In the case of the heated sample, it presented more residue on the top of the well, and this could be due to the protein aggregation as observed in the confocal microscope. We can observe the characteristic band of Rubisco around 55 kilodaltons. After the gastric phase, the band of Rubisco had completely disappeared and more smearing was observed in the bottom of the gel, which could be due to smaller peptides produced by the protein digestion. After the intestinal phase, just the bands related with the pancreatin were observed, and some shadows at the lower molecular weights, which were the digested peptides. With all this, we can conclude that the protein structure studied presented a high digestibility. Green leaves are a promising source of highly digestible proteins, mainly constituted by Rubisco. The amino acid profile of the protein extracts covered the recommendations for all the essential amino acids from the FAO 2011. And the digestibility was not affected by the heat treatment. Thank you so much for listening to the talk. And now I would like to introduce the next speaker, uh, Marina Einhorn. Uh, she is a PhD student from Technical University in Berlin in the Department of Food Technology and Material Science. She is studying about in vitro digestion of plant-based pectin uh, protein conjugates. So Marina, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. It's great to have you all be part of our webinar today. Thank you, Andre, for the nice overview of the topic and the kind introduction. After a study on the digestion of alternative proteins, I would like to talk about the combination of plant proteins with polysaccharides such as pectin and their digestibility. This study on conjugates was done in collaboration with Anna Biotechnologies and Chagas Food Research Center in Ireland. What we wanted to investigate. The aim of the study was to investigate the in vitro digestion behavior of conjugates produced with potato protein using different types of pectin, lometoxylated and lometoxylated amidated pectin. Conjugates are covalently linked polymers where the formation is part of the initial stage of the Maillard reaction, where free amino groups of the protein reacts with a free carbonyl group of the polysaccharide to an Amadori product. So Maya reaction-based conjugation is a strategy to improve the plant protein's ability to stabilize emulsions. The functionality of these conjugates strongly depends on the chemical structure of the polymers, in this case of pectin, specifically the degree of amidation. And of course, these factors can affect the digestibility of the conjugates, making them an interesting material for encapsulation systems with a customized release of functional components. Samples in this study were digested following the static in vitro digestion protocol, InfoGest 2.0, individually and in a cookie model system. How do conjugates behave during the in vitro digestion? During the oral phase, the conjugates should stay intact. During further steps, the conjugated protein can be partly hydrolyzed by pepsin in the gastric and by pancreatine proteases in the intestinal phase. Conjugated pectin is not degraded by digestive enzymes, but the acidic pH in the gastric phase 
and the presence of calcium cations lead to gelation of the gastric mix. Gelation during the gastric phase decreases the efficiency of mixing with enzymes. Confocal microscopy images of the gastric mix show no gelation for the protein sample. For conjugates with low metoxylated pectin, gelled gastric mix showed in homogeneous aggregates and for conjugates with amidated pectin, evenly distributed gel network. This type of gel network during the gastric phase may result in the protection of conjugated protein against hydrolysis. At the end of the intestinal phase, the digestibility of the samples was calculated based on the determination of the total nitrogen of digestible and indigestible fractions. The protein digestibility was below 60. The conjugates with low metoxylated pectin with and without cookie showed similar or higher digestibility than protein. The conjugates with amidated pectin without cookie showed lower digestibility and thus presented higher resistance to digestion. This may relate it to the gastric homogeneous gelation. In the case of the cookie model system, the evenly distributed gel network can be disrupted. This makes the conjugated proteins more accessible to enzymes and thus the digestibility increases again. Summarizing the digestive behavior of the conjugates, we can highlight that conjugated pectin induces gelation during the gastric phase depending on the pectin type. Depending on the food matrix, protein conjugated with amidated pectin shows a different digestibility. And in general, conjugates can be used as a material for encapsulation system that required release during digestion and can be applied in various food matrices. This brings me to the end of this case study. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello. So, <clears throat> thank you very much. And um, yes, I'm also allowed to introduce the next speaker. And the next speaker is Juan Comilaf, a PhD student from Universidad de la Fantera in Chile. So he will briefly present his study entitled Evaluation in Vitro Gastrointestinal Digestion of Plant-Based Protein Polysaccharide System. So Juan, the stage is yours. Hello to everyone. My name is Juan Comilaf. I'm a PhD student from Universidad de la Frontera in Chile, and today I'm going to talk about evaluation in vitro gastrointestinal digestion of plant-based protein polysaccharide systems. The encapsulation is a technique used to protect compounds, giving to them a better stability, immobilization, shelf life, improving also their release through the gastrointestinal tract, being the last one a big barrier for their delivery. Thus, Polysaccharides are used for this technique, specifically sodium alginate. This polymer has been used in different knowledge areas as a food, pharmaceutical, medical, and others do other properties, being biodegradable, biocompatible, and also non-toxic. Alginate can be cross-linked by external gelation or internal gelation using polyvalent calcions such as magnesium and calcium, as can be observed in the figure 2. However, it's necessary to improve it. Plant-based protein is not just a good alternative of amino acid. It's also recognized due to their functional properties being able to improve encapsulation system. Then, the objective of this work was to evaluate the gastrointestinal digestibility by in vitro simulation of the alginate protein systems. The methodology of this work is shown in the page 5. Pea protein, soy protein, hemp protein, and alginate were mixed at different pH to be dropped into calcium chloride, being able to obtain protein alginate beads, which were subsequently digested through the InfoJets protocol. 
Set a potential, con focal laser scanning microscopy, protein encapsulation efficiency, beads diameter distribution, and protein release at the end of the gastric and intestinal phase were determined in this work. As a result, in the figure 5, it's possible to see the dependence of the zeta potential at different pH for 1% weight volume of each protein and alginate. In the figure 6, A1, B1, and C1, is, it's a confocal microscopy image for 1% weight volume of each protein. And A2, B2, and C2, it's the protein alginate mixture image at pH 4. And A3, B3, and C3, it's the image for protein alginate mixture at pH 7. Figure 7 shows the bits diameter distribution of hydrogels load with SPI, HPI, and PPI. And the figure 8 shows the confocal microscopy image of the structure of the hydrogel bits load with HPI, SPI, and PPI at pH 4 and pH 7. The figure 9 shows the encapsulation capacity of each protein by the alginate at different pH. According to this, the hydrogel elaborate at pH 7 were able to have a better performance in the protein encapsulation. However, the hydrogel bits produced at pH 4 were able to better modulate the release of the protein in both the gastric and the intestinal phases. Then, the alginate facilitates the creation of the hydrogel bits for plant protein modulation under simulated gastrointestinal conditions. Variations in pH during the production of hydrogel bits and the type of the encapsulate proteins produce different in the protein release during the gastric and the intestinal phases. The structural designs allow progress in the development of capsules taking advantage of the buffering effect of the protein to encapsulate bioactive compounds. Finally, my acknowledgements goes to the European project ENCA for Health, Chagas Moore Park, Universidad de la Frontera, Dr. Eder Hernández Olivas, Dr. Andre Brodkor, Dr. Monica Rubilar, and the ANIT National PhD Scholarship Chile. Thank you so much. So, thank you for the, in, the introduction, um, Marina. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. So, she is Maria Gloria. She's a graduate in pharmacy and chemistry from Universidad de la Frontera in Chile. And she's specialized in microstructural characterization, microscopy, and sample preparation. So, let's hear the presentation. Good afternoon, my name is Maria Gloria. I'm from Chile, and today I will talk about my project, Microstructural Characterization and Digestibility of Pectin Grass Protein Microcapsules. The aim of this study is to develop innovative approaches to produce microcapsules using pectin and protein and assess their digestibility and the microstructural changes during the static in vitro digestion. The optimization process consists in select or identify the best type of pectin based on two criteria. One is the percentage of protein loss and the amount of protein retained within the microcapsules. So we analyze four different types of citrus low methoxyl pectin, three of them with different degree of esterification, and one of them was amidated. To prepare the microbits, we mix each pectin with whey protein isolate in three different ratios. Then, this mixture were processed using a burette, and the drops were falling into a calcium chloride bath. After the microbits formation, we measure the protein content in the microbits and in the supernatant using Dumas method. So then, based on this data, we select the pectin number two 
and whey protein isolate in a one to one ratio for two reasons because it results in the highest encapsulation efficiency and the lowest percentage loss of protein. So we are using equal amount of protein and pectin to create our wall matrix. The encapsulation method involved mixing protein with pectin and the pectin alone was used as a blank. The protein that we used were whey protein isolate and grass protein concentrate, which was extracted following Sara Perez's method, as she presented in the previous video. Then this mixture of protein and pectin was loaded into the encapsulator to produce microcapsules by external dilation in a calcium chloride bath. Finally, these microbeads were subjected to an in vitro digestion following the InfoGest method. In the micrographs from confocal laser scanning microscopy and light microscopy, we can observe and compare the microstructural changes of the microbeads at the initial or starter phase and after gastric and intestinal phase. The red color indicates the protein content inside the microbeads. Here, in the grass protein concentrate pectin microcapsules, we can see the presence of insoluble protein particles and the changes in the microbeads shapes during digestion. And also there is a loss of the brown color indicating a loss of protein. In contrast, the micrographs of pectin microbeads show that their shapes remain intact during all digestion. And the particle size graph indicate that all the microcapsules undergo shrinkage in the gastric phase and swelling in intestinal phase. This variation is because the different pH levels during the gastrointestinal digestion. In conclusion, we can say that the grass protein can be incorporated into protein and pectin microbeads. The grass protein may offer functional and nutritional properties while increasing the pectin concentration increases the gel strength and the pectin and protein systems could be used as encapsulation matrices to incorporate bioactive compounds. Finally, I want to thank to my supervisors in cap for health SACASC and Universidad de la Frontera for this incredible opportunity. Well, so with this, we have uh, listened to a really nice and interesting presentation of uh, some of our secondis, and we can begin already with the discussion. Uh, there was already a comment uh, about um, uh, we should uh, share the webinar presentation. So yes, uh, the webinar presentation will be uploaded in our YouTube channel. Uh, and the YouTube channel name is Bioencapsulation and Microencapsulation. You have the link in LinkedIn, and it was uh, the channel where we are also presenting online. And also, there were two questions uh, for Andre. And people would, uh, so Miroslava and Tanasova would like to know a bit more about your experience with static digestion, especially uh, related to protein concentrates and how and which analytical methods you use uh, to evaluate uh, new, new products? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, milk proteins or milk products have been widely used, uh, analyzed by the uh, digestion methods, the infogest method and semi-dynamic methods. So milk protein concentrates or isolates or whole milk, uh, that has been done you know, on numerous occasions and also correlated with in vivo data, that's the animal, animal trials, and human intervention uh, data from uh, uh, jejunal, so from the jejunum, from the small intestine of, of humans. So as I said during the, uh, um, the lecture, um, static methods are, are not good or not suitable for uh, evaluating the dynamics, so kinetics of digestion. So the static methods will not tell you whether whey proteins are fast proteins or slow proteins. So what you see actually in SDS page gel 
is that the caseins are digested and the whey proteins are not digested in unheated uh, milk or milk protein concentrates. Um, however, a whey protein is known to be a fast protein. So if you want to look at the kinetics, you have to use semi-dynamic methods. However, if you look at the end of gastric and the end of intestinal phase, it is pretty accurate and it can be correlated to the in vivo data. Uh, concerning methods, like you've seen a couple of methods in the case studies. So if you are interested in the proteins, then the obvious choice is, you know, SDS page gels, that's always rock solid. Um, if you have some kind of solid matrix, uh, microscopy is all, also good. Uh, visual appearance is, is important. And then you have the uh, uh, chemical methods that would be uh, HBSE, so size exclusion, for instance, and degree of hydrolysis. So there are several methods. Uh, the OPA method is a degree of hydrolysis method is also widely used. Okay, so there are a number of methods. Just look up, you know, milk and infogest method. There, there are a number, number of methods out there. If you have any more questions, you can send me an email, uh, Miroslava. Thanks a lot, Andre, for that detailed answer. And there is also a question, again, from Miroslava. She was really interested in our talks. And this in this time, <laughs> it was related to the alginate. If there is any limit for the alginate molecular weight when we are using it uh, with... So if there is any, any limit to the size of the proteins when they are used together for encapsulation system, and if the system could work with peptides. So exactly. what? Yes, thanks for the question. Well, in general, you can use any uh, polysaccharide to encapsulate protein or peptide, but the limit of this type of work is the process. I mean, if you want to encapsulate peptides or amino acids or something like that, you need to consider the calcium chloride concentration in the jelly, gelling bath, for example, because when you have a high concentration, you can um, have a, um, um, how to say, um, smaller uh, poros in your, uh, in your bead, and that can work better to encapsulate the, the peptides. Yeah, if I can come in there. Uh, yes, in principle, you can use you know most most proteins, but then you need some kind of interaction between the polymer and the protein, and that that's crucial. So uh, that also applies for peptides. Yes, you can. So that has been used in in the past, as published. However, you need an interaction between the alginate and the peptide. The peptide is very small. If they don't interact, they just leak out. Okay, so you need some kind of charge interaction or hydrophobic interaction also. So if they don't interact, they just leak out. Thanks a lot uh, for this uh, short discussion. And there is also a question related to conjugation of the proteins. That was also a hot topic. Uh, in this time, Menat Samansu is asking, and as I understood it, uh, she would like to know the digestibility of protein, how is it, it is affected once it's conjugated, if it is improved, if it's um, worse. So Marina, please. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a great question. So maybe at the beginning, uh, like a small clarif uh, clarification, we uh, checked our conjugates in comparison to a protein. So the protein digestibility was around 60%. And then depends on the type of the conjugate, we could um, somehow alter the digestibility of the protein. So somehow their conjugates, and depending on the pectin type we have in our conjugates, we can protect our protein or let them digest as it is. So depending on the conjugation type, we have different ways for to digest the protein. And this is also depends really strong from the food matrix we're using for the uh, digestibility. So somehow we can protect and we can increase, we can both. Yeah, Thanks I'm... a lot for that answer. Please, yeah. Andre. As well. So, uh... The, the question was also bioavailability, okay? So bioavailability is is related to the absorption through the gut mm -hmm. cell. So uh, there are really only two methods, okay? Either you go in vivo, so pigs or humans, um, or the other uh, method would be in vitro cell cultures, 
um, and there has been a lot of progress done recently. So there are basically Kaku 2 cells or co-cultures, uh, um, that's HT29 M MCT, M MTX, so they are um, um, mucus forming uh, cells, you basically form a monolayer, you put your digester on top and look what is going through that, okay? So it is probably difficult enough to predict it, okay? Uh, but there have been examples of conjugates, uh, very small molecules uh, crossing crossing the barrier, but they have to be small. So if they if you have a conjugate, you know, of some amino acids with a huge poly polysaccharide, that will unlikely cross cross the barrier. Okay, but they are in vitro methods. Thanks, Andre. Okay, thanks, Andre, for the clarification and highlighting the difference between digestibility and viability. Always. Good to know. And uh, I think with this, so questions are ready. Again, another person is asking about uh, uh, the webinar presentation. So all of them will be in our YouTube channel. You will have the whole webinar online so you can watch your favorite sections again anytime you want. And um, well, we have a last second question. So. It is about, um, so could you please elaborate the difference between the cookie methods and the non cookie method? So I guess, Andre, you could answer that one. Or maybe Sarah. Or, you, yeah. you, you, <laughs> or any of you, because all of you <laughs> were really deep in info, yes. I will try it and then Andre can always make some comments. So the when we are eating the protein, we are well when we are eating, we are not eating the protein, we are eating like a food. It's a food matrix and there are many components in there. So when we are simulating that digestion in an in vitro model, we cannot just digest the protein itself. I mean we can do it, but the result will not be as similar to the physiological result that we will have in the in our track so the cookie it's introduced to make like a matrix and um, that will stimulate what will be in the food matrix when we are eating so it will help like for instance in the auto auto hydrolysis of the enzymes during the digestion if we are not putting that matrix uh, the enzymes that we are introducing for simulating the digestibility will hydrolyze themselves, so it will be affecting the digestion. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Cool. So uh, with this, I think uh, we are ready with questions. Yeah. That was the last uh, minute one. So uh, from my side, thanks a lot to all of you, not only for this nice presentation, but for all the time we have been working together and how much I have learn and have fun with all of you, even sending several mails. And uh, so thanks a lot from my side. Okay. Andrew, if you would like to uh, uh, say like goodbye, finish uh, the webinar. Okay, excellent. Yeah, Thank, thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Yes, we will share it as uh, Rothio said, uh, the easiest way is just to go to YouTube and uh, look for bioencapsulation, bioencapsulation or microencapsulation. I just typed it into the uh, answer or go back to LinkedIn. You can follow myself or Rothio. Um, and we we actually have two uh, YouTube channels, one on bioencapsulation and the other one on food food digestion. So if you're interested in the subject, there's plenty of information there. Okay, so I'd like to thank all, all the speakers, all the panelists, and thanks for turning up. Okay, bye. Bye.